The city is alive with activity. You Hi, I'm Dave Evans, and welcome to 999. NYC Media knows everything about the city. And now you can take us with you everywhere you go. Our new iPhone app has tons of information about places to eat, things to do, and much more. Download the NYC Media app from iTunes and discover New York. This week from New York Times TV, Metro section reporter Emily Hager follows an unusual artist with an unlikely muse. The minimalist Mark Bittman turns the classic hamburger on its head. In Street Takes, Detective Frank Serpico comments on the movie he inspired. And from the city room, Chinese supermarkets in Flushing find creative ways to stop shoplifting. These stories and more from the New York Times. At the Changjiang supermarket on Casino Boulevard in Flushing, Queens, shoplifting is so rampant that even the live seafood isn't safe. There was just one guy who came to shoplift. He packed three lobsters and put them in this bag. And then the claws came out and grabbed them. And then they all fell down. You would never imagine the things people take. The market offers special prices on its seafood, but for people who don't feel like paying them and get caught stealing by store officials, there are also special prices the store charges to buy your way out of being arrested. The police don't especially think this is a crime. The most they'll get is 24 hours. That's the way the law is. Store officials say that shoplifters who initially plead poverty suddenly come up with the money being demanded to avoid calling the police. And if they only have credit cards, well, the store accepts them too. If there has to be a fine, then there's a fine. They just say, run my credit card, just like that. They take out their wallet and they have lots of money. They don't care. For shoplifters who are less afraid of the police, store officials detain them and take their picture, which they post prominently around the premises. At the A&N food market, also in Flushing, a manager monitoring the store's elaborate surveillance system said he charges accused shoplifters a minimum of $400 to leave the police out of it. You know, sometimes they only steal ten dollars worth of merchandise, but they end up paying four hundred bucks. You understand? Know and you know, and that's a deterrent enough for them the next time they're gonna be like, you know, what? I'm not gonna go to that supermarket anymore to steal. You know. Jason Sanchez says he has worked as a security guard at several Chinese-owned markets in the past that photographed and collected money from shoplifters. The manager speaks to them, you know, then they discuss the, the price. So, you know, at ANC it was $400. They just beg, don't call the police, we'll do anything, but pay whatever you ask, we'll take your pictures, whatever you want, just don't call the police, you know, that's... Why? Um, the, the one that I remember was he was he was in the league where he didn't have any any cards any any kind of paperwork at all so he knew that he would be in some kind of trouble you know the practice of demanding payment from accused shoplifters varies by interpretation of New York State law shopkeepers do have some latitude in detaining and exacting compensation from shoplifters but this can easily veer into extortion. Officials at both the New York Police Department and the Queens District Attorney's Office said they had not received any complaints about the practice. They declined to comment on the legality. These wall of shame style displays of shoplifter snapshots are prevalent, as seen here in a store in Chinatown in Manhattan, which posts names, addresses, and social security numbers on some Polaroids. This store under the Manhattan Bridge has been the subject of complaints from shoppers who say they have been unfairly detained and searched. It should be said that all the people shown in photographs in this video have only been accused by store owners. There is no indication that any have been formally charged by the authorities, and we were unable to reach them for their side of the story. The Chung Fat Market in Flushing has a photo gallery near the cashiers, along with a poster that announces fines of $500 and $2,000 for repeat offenders. But store officials here say they never really wind up collecting anywhere near these amounts. Officials at this market in Elmhurst, Queens, say they do not demand fines, but they insist that posting photographs does deter thievery by seizing upon the keen sense of shame and reputation within the close-knit Chinese immigrant community here. They are worried about their reputation or something, and if they arrest, we, we, we we must have some employees have a witness, but most of the employees cannot speak English very well. So this is your own way of, of kind of enforcing the law in a way? I mean, yeah. yeah, yes, our own way. Some local activists have called these enforcement practices unfair. To force another person to pay a few hundred bucks, that's extortion. A lot of you know, uh, community members here, they 
do not have a legal status. Mm -hmm. So they have to face severe consequences. If somebody put a picture of mine, you know, accusing that, you know, I'm uh, shoplifting, the business owner invade my uh, privacy and also violating my uh, civil rights, human rights. Many store owners admit that these tactics are ruthless, but they say that the only way they can deal with the rampant shoplifting is by shaming the perpetrators into stopping. We we'll walk them around the supermarket and show everybody around, you know, what they're stealing, you know, and we'll have a manager come around and tell them, oh, this is a thief, you know, and we'll walk them around, you know, if that's the shame factor, if that's what really hurts them more than paying the money, then it'll work better that way, you know. But that is the walk of, that is truly the walk of shame. It's truly the walk of shame. I've done it, I've done it here before as well. Next in the Metro section, reporter Emily Hager follows radio reporter Mark Malinsky while he pursues his passion for art in the New York subway. It is almost like hunting in a weird way. It's like the thrill of the hunt, but it's a hunt for a great looking face or a really interesting looking person. Eric Malinsky is a freelance radio reporter, but he has a hobby. He likes drawing people on New York City subways using his iPhone. By using my finger, uh, there is sort of a crudeness that I'm forced to really respond to what I see. And I think the drawings in a weird way are much better than if I had been using a, a sketchbook. I don't let people know that I'm doing this. If they glance and look at me like, is that guy drawing me? And I'll kind of look away, nope, not at all. And then, you know, if uh, they then just continue reading, that's fine. But if they're really looking at me, and I, if they're annoyed, then forget it, I'm done. Malinsky is not the only artist working on the iPhone's canvas. Jorge Colombo uses it to draw cityscapes for The New Yorker. Malinsky uses an app called Sketchbook. Each of his initial drawings take about 30 seconds. First, he does a quick black and white sketch. I try to capture what I see, because what's out there is always so much more interesting than what I would have come up with in my head. And then he lays down layers of color. On the subway, sometimes you don't really have that much time, because people are always coming in and out. Or I need to go. Often, Malinsky has to finish the details at home. So something like this, you know, I may want to add another layer. Then I go back, and you know, maybe I want to clean that up. Ah, there we go. That's better. Um, he posts his drawings to a blog and now has nearly 300 drawings on the site. Including one of me. For the New York Times, this is Emily Hager. Coming up, health columnist Tara Parker Pope challenges New Yorkers to drop and give her 20. Here we're demonstrating the correct form to maintain throughout this exercise. Notice from the back of the head, through the spine and shoulders, buttocks, down to the heels, it's a straight line. Elbows in close to your body, baby. Keep the push-up has long been a symbol of strength and vitality. Put those abs in. Begin push-ups by bending the elbows and lowering the entire body until the top of the upper arms, shoulders, and lower back are aligned and parallel to the deck. They're painful. They're not fun, but it would be awesome if I could do 15 without putting my knees down like a girl. Fitness pioneer Jack LaLanne wowed us by doing push-ups on his fingertips, and actor Jack Palance dropped to do one-armed push-ups in 1992 during his Oscar acceptance speech. More recently, Carnegie Mellon professor Randy Pausch did push-ups to demonstrate his wellness, even while battling pancreatic cancer. I'm in really good shape. In fact, I'm in better shape than most of you. <laughs> while push-ups often are used to impress, experts in biomechanics note that they are essential to healthy aging, especially in lessening the severity of falls and enabling one to get back up. If I were to ask you to drop down right now and give me 20 push-ups, could you do it? If you can't, tell me why. It's been about 20 years, but I should be able to do 20 push-ups. Hold that for me, brother. Okay, here we go. No. <laughs> I smoke cigarettes. Well, if golf helped, I'd be in good shape. But push-ups, I don't think I can do. I am too old and too heavy. I can't do it because I'm slightly overweight. <laughs> I can. I actually do 30 every morning. 
Yes, I could. Yes, I would. <laughs> 10, 11. Well, the answer is I couldn't do it um, because I'm not fit. I eat too much, drink too much, and do, don't do enough exercise. If you asked me the same question about uh, 30 years ago, you might have got the same answer. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta go with the bag. Whenever doing push-ups, don't overturn your hands out too much. It's very bad for your wrists. When doing push-ups, stick with the bases. The triangle, the regular, and the wide for your shoulders. Bring those hands inside your body. There you go, now stick your chest out. The push-up can be particularly out. challenging for women. Women have higher body fat, leaving less room for muscle. As a result, women have about 20% less strength per unit of body weight than men. So how many push-ups should you be able to do? Based on national averages, at the age of 40, a man should be able to do 27 consecutive push-ups and a woman 16. I'm Tara Parker Pope, well columnist for the New York Times. Give me 20. You know what? Give me 40. Straight ahead, the minimalist Mark Bittman makes a delicious alternative to the standard beef burger. I grew up eating sausage and peppers, mostly in Little Italy, which was at that time around McDougal Street. And um, man, I loved that stuff. And as the years went by, store-bought sausage got sort of worse and worse. And I was wondering what to do. And then one day, 25, 30 years ago, I stumbled into this place in Southport, Connecticut, where the guy who owned it, Ed, was making handmade sausage patties out of ground pork and spices slapping them together like a burger, putting them on a roll. That's the best thing, and that's what we're going to do right now. There are a number of keys to good sausage, and um, some people may not like to hear this, but one of them is fat. The other is good spices, and the third is pork. I mean, pork makes the best sausage. But what you don't need is to encase the sausage. A patty is in many ways better than a link because you have more surface area and you get better browning. This is a high-fat dish, but we're going to start with the low-fat quotient, which is fennel. And I think you put a little real fennel in a fennel sausage, and you get super, super flavor. So fennel and fennel seed, a lot, and garlic, because what's a sausage without garlic? And grind that up. Now, if you have a bigger food processor than this, you can do this all at once, but I'm going to have to do it in three stages, as you'll see. So grind that up. So it's kind of chopped oniony. It's important to use fennel here, not, you can use some onion, mix some onion in, but none of this apple thing or forget that. You want some, a little bit of crunch. Now the fat. The good sausage is 30% fat. So we're doing 25% as an accommodation to those of you who think 30 sounds like a lot. But I snuck some fat into the meat also. This is fat from pork shoulder and that's also the cut of meat you should be using. You need a couple pounds of pork shoulder, which usually will have a nice layer of fat on it that you cut off and grind separately. Okay, so this needs to be ground as if you were grinding meat. Again, you probably have a better food processor than this, but we have a very limited budget. Ground pork, fat. You know, it may look like it, but it, it, this is definitely not smoked salmon with cream cheese. We need meat and we need salt. So here's the meat. You know, you don't want to puree this. You want meat here. It could be a tiny, no, I think this is good. You want ground meat. You want to mimic what it's like if you put meat through a grinder. It's not regular. It's different pieces, dis different sized pieces of meat. And now you mix. 
Now, Ed used to make these things massive. I'm trying to keep it under control here. It's pretty big. And then a hot pan. And a little bit of pepper, a little bit of onion. The fat from the sausage is gonna take care of that. Obviously, you don't need any olive oil or any other fat in the pan. This sausage patty is 25 to 30% fat, so you will see. We will get some fat in here. It's gonna be nice. So, um, it's not as, not as egregious an amount of fat as you might think. We're ready to turn here. And uh, another four or five minutes will be done. Now, I'm not super, super uptight about well done pork, but this, as it happens, I cooked this well done, but it's about 10 minutes total, a little bit less if you're not worried. A word about the hard roll. When I was a kid, we had these things in New York called hard rolls that were actually hard rolls. That is, they were crusty rolls, sort of like ros the rosettes that you get in um, Rome. Now they're soft, mushy things. So I've toasted, taken the liberty of you know that? toasting this a bit in the oven to get some crunch in there. It's a nice looking sandwich, wouldn't you say? There's the fat. Mmm. Oh man. This is so great, and I have to say, I'm gonna use more garlic next time. Thank you, Ed. Up next, 40 years after testifying against police corruption, Detective Frank Serpico still has a lot to say. I always said that no matter how big or how much corruption there is, never greater than the individual or the might um, of doing the right thing. He may be playing the harmonica now, but 40 years ago, Frank Serpico was blowing the whistle on widespread corruption in the New York Police Department. It made him a pariah on the force, and he was shot during a drug bust in 1971 while screaming for his backup. Serpico went on to testify in front of the Knapp Commission on Police Corruption and was famously profiled in print and on the big screen before virtually disappearing from the public eye for nearly 40 years. After a decade wandering Europe and North America, he finally settled here in Columbia County in upstate New York, about two hours north of New York City, where he's a familiar face around town. I spent a few days with him up here, walking in the woods and talking in coffee shops. He enjoys the solitude of nature as a healing force against the lingering trauma from the scandal and the shooting. Those who have seen the film know that the Serpico character, played by Al Pacino, was big on disguises in his plainclothes police work. And each day I visited, true to form, Frank would show up in some new getup. He's currently writing his memoirs and can often be found working away on the computers in the local library, which is where I prevailed upon him recently to watch Serpico, the 1973 film, on my laptop. He said it was the first time he had ever fully seen the film, and during the painful opening scenes, he still couldn't bear to watch. It's been so, you know, worked out of my psyche, you know. It's just amazing that um, 38 years later, why you're talking about it. And there's division playing close. This is actually an illegitimate arrest. Uh, but that happened all the time, you know. You started taping your calls? Oh, yeah. I wanted to have it on record. Yeah, this was a, the Bronx courthouse. You know, this is when they find out that my partner was keeping the money. I wasn't getting it, so it was a lot of pressure. Exact setup to my apartment. That's Pacino drinking his favorite wine. Yeah, now, see, this is like it's happening before I go in and see the inspector. It's just a, a, a show of bravado. You had good fighting skills? Did you have jiu-jitsu? Uh, black belt. This is what uh, the system wants to do. It, it wants to intimidate the good guys. And that's why it's so important for individuals uh, to stand up and do the right thing. The police commissioner wouldn't come near me with a 10-foot pole except for a photo op. Not one of New York's 39,000 showed up to give me blood. 
really nobody nobody volunteered this didn't happen in the hospital this is total you know this is the hollywood part uh, it's a phony shield <laughs> so what was it presented at your ho in the no, hospital no way they handed it to me over the counter with the medal of honor like a pack of cigarettes and they never even had a ceremony for me i wasn't invited to the promotion ceremonies nothing yeah, this I wrote my own little thing, and uh, there was quite a turnout there. It was, in a way, a load off my shoulder, you know. Mm. Yeah, well, I used to hang out on the dock there with uh, Alfie. That was right by my uh, apartment. I've taken my knocks, but uh, I feel I'm a better person for it. And I think, yeah, it is a good moral lesson. You have to go up against the odds to do the right thing. I certainly uh, don't have any regrets. And now, Frank Bruni heads to Greenpoint, Brooklyn to check on an updated classic, Piano Bars. You don't expect to hear this here in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which is a sort of hipster haven. But the Manhattan Inn, which is fairly new, is a different kind of piano bar. Most time, my guess is that if people come here and they're not already familiar with this place, they probably came here because they read, oh, piano bar, and then are probably surprised afterwards because it wasn't the piano bar they assumed it may have been. When you say they've made erroneous assumptions, they think they're going to be able to walk up to the bar and sing a Judy Garland tune? <laughs> That's happened a couple times. <laughs> this is a very hip place, actually. They're featuring ragtime and boogie-woogie and stride and that, that kind of thing. They're, they're going retro. I mean, I'm as retro as you can, you can get. I think we're so used to going to bars and hearing some aggro, you know, noise rock or something that it's it's refreshing to have some guy just plucking away on a on a piano. You know? A lot of times I'll get something. Oh yeah, my grandfather used to play. <laughs> that that makes you feel real good and young. Right? Well, yeah. <laughs> Finally, another happy couple takes the plunge in this edition of Vows. Rebecca came in as a patient. I needed a dentist. I had moved here from California. Found one right across the street and made an appointment. I came out to get her, to bring her to the room. I looked up and then I thought, oh no, I hope that's not the dentist. He's not old. <laughs> You know, he, was young, he looked so young and handsome. And I'm still his patient, and um, it's fun. It's, he's a good dentist, and it's fun to come in and reminds me of uh, how we met. <laughs> and of course, my teeth were a mess, so I had to come back a lot to get my cavities taken care of, and I needed a root canal. <laughs> so I was here a lot. You know, we had a pretty easy chemistry to begin with. We would talk a lot in the during our visits and I would find myself getting really excited to go to the dentist and I would pick out something cute to wear that day. <laughs> Touch up my makeup a little bit. Ethically, I was definitely concerned. Um, to be totally honest, I asked my father, who's my moral compass, and he said that as long as I was doing everything the same way I would do it with every other patient while I was working, it was okay. I had a little crush on my dentist at that point. I texted him to see if he wanted to meet at a bar in the neighborhood, so I did the asking. <laughs> and I did, and we've been together ever since. I knew pretty early on that this was good, and I was happy, and very happy, and didn't really want anything else. We love to travel together. I would go away every month of the year somewhere cool with my backpack and Lee in his backpack. We went traveling in Cambodia, and then I was so tempted to 
just drop down to one knee and propose, and I had thought about bringing like a fake ring. We'd been traveling pretty ruggedly, so I didn't want to bring an expensive ring with me, so I had held off, and she came home, and I had some candles lit and had all the photographs of the places where I wanted to propose, and I did. I said I would have brought, I would have proposed in Cambodia, but I couldn't bring this. And he pulled out the ring, and got down on my knee and I was like laughing uncontrollably for some reason. <laughs> but it was really, it was really sweet and special and it was awesome.